Hey guys, welcome to Ring Still TV. Today is episode four in our $500 1,000 yard steel elk challenge. Stay tuned. Okay guys, we got a lot of talk about this week. So we'll be installing the muzzle brake. I'm also gonna bring out the scope that we've selected so you guys can see that. We'll also have a discussion around uh, 20 MOA scope bases and why we might select one. Uh, then also a discussion around optics. And the last thing I wanna do is show you guys uh, before and after on the barrel break-in. Um, I have finished the barrel break-in, so I took some bore cam photos before and after. So well, you'll get a chance to see all that. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this episode. On with the build. Okay, let's look at the first item that we're gonna install here. This is a muzzle brake. I got this muzzle brake on eBay and this is how it came packaged. Uh, if we go inside, you can see here's the muzzle brake. It also included a nut, jam nut, and two cr crush washers, one in stainless and one that's blued black. Here's the brake itself. It's a surprisingly well machined item by the looks of it, the threading's good here on the back. Everything looks to be well proportioned. We'll just measure the um, the exit hole here and see how well it's centered. First measurement is 3.23, 3.23 there. Three point two two and a half, and three point two three. So this hole is pretty well centered in the center, maybe a half a thousandths off in one direction should not be an issue. I also want to measure how big that hole is there, and that is uh, three four four. So for our 30 caliber build, this should be great. Let's say we go ahead and get this installed. Okay guys, let's install this muzzle brake. The first thing we're gonna do here is uh, unthread the thread protector that's on the end of our TC Compass rifle. And uh, in this case, I like to be able to take my muzzle brakes and, and get them off the barrel when I'm cleaning so that I can clean the face of the crown here. Uh, sometimes you'll get some carbon buildup there and that can affect the trajectory of the bullet. So uh, I'm going to use the jam nut instead of the crush washer so that I can easily get this break off as needed. So I'm going to thread this down to the barrel as far as it'll go. And then next we'll take our muzzle break and we'll just kind of see where the timing is. Uh, you can see on this break these two top ports should be facing straight up. So we'll see where they're at. Okay, so in this case we can see here that, that, that these two are uh, pointing off into this direction and in order for me to do this I would have to back this off a full turn and then move the nut straight up on top of it and that's how I would correct this but what I'd like to do is try sometimes if you flip these nuts around you'll get a little better purchase on it and you might not have to move it so far forward so we're going to flip this nut around here and reinstall it and then we'll thread the muzzle brake on and see if we've gotten any closer. Okay, that's much better. So you can see here these are pointing up now um, and then what I'll do is I'll take these levels, these two bubble levels, and I'll put one on the Picatinny rail and ensure that the gun is, uh, is level on the Picatinny rail. Then I'll put the other one on the muzzle brake on those ports. And you can see we need to make a minor adjustment here. So what I like to do is we'll take a wrench and then I'll take these pliers here, they have a coated end. I'll just stick those in there so it doesn't damage the muzzle. And then we'll move this around so that it so that it stays level. Okay. OK, 
Okay, that's looking pretty good. I'm going to double check the rifle here and make sure that it's balanced. And it is. It's perfectly level. So you can see now we have these uh, gas ports perfectly straight up and down. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is normally I would put blue thread lock on these threads. I am still breaking in this gun, which means I am removing this muzzle device after every shot until it's broken in. So I'm not going to put the thread lock on there until I'm finished breaking in the rifle. At that point, I'll put some thread lock. All right, last thing I like to do is get our cleaning rod. This is a Dewey coated 30 caliber cleaning rod. I'm going to put this up into the gun and just make sure that we've got clearance on at the end of this deal. And that looks really good. So uh, I'm feeling pretty confident about this muzzle brake. We'll give it a shot and see how it goes. Okay guys, time to talk about optics and what we selected for this gun. Uh, this was really a big challenge for me. Uh, optics are one of the most important pieces to any weapon, especially when you start going down to range. Their ability to track, their optical clarity. Uh, these are all super important uh, deals, things that we have to deal with. And as I was putting the budget together for this build, uh, it became clear I was going to need to be in the 100 to 110 dollar price range, somewhere in there. And, uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of options. Um, really needed to look towards the used market and see what was available. So I went out on eBay, looked at several different manufacturers, several different scopes, and finally landed on this. This is an Athlon Optics. It is a Talos 4 to 16 by 40. Um, I selected this for two primary reasons. One, Athlon touts a lifetime transferable warranty. You don't need a receipt or anything like that to be able to get service on your uh, optic. Uh, and they'll do the warranty for any reason at all. In fact, I had an opportunity um, a year or two years ago to go to Kansas City and visit with these guys and really had a great time with them super nice group of people and customer service was paramount for them so um like i said found this on ebay it was 109 dollars delivered and um i'm hoping that it's gonna it's gonna work for us um one of the important factors that we were at least 16x i was hoping to be in the 20 to 24x but that just wasn't going to work out with our budget, so it's one of the reasons why I selected this. Let's take a look at the scope. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised when this came in. It looked brand new to me. Um, I did not have, uh, there's really no marks on it. I don't even know that it was ever mounted onto a uh, gun. Um, everything seems to work fine. It has parallax adjustments here on the side from 10 yards to infinity. Uh, it's got cap turrets. This particular model is in mill mill and also has a mill reticle. The uh, click adjustments are fairly positive and audible. The windage adjustments a little bit better than the up down, but, but definitely serviceable. No issues there. The uh, power adjustment here is firm. No, no, no great issues here. Optically, you know, it's okay. I haven't had it on a gun and really looked at it at any distance, so we'll do this once we get it installed. Also has a diopter adjustment on the rear, just like most of the scopes do nowadays. All right, guys. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about why we selected a 20 MOA rail. This is a question I get asked sometimes, and I actually started this video at least six times and just couldn't get get it together i like to take these in one take so uh, i took some good notes here and hopefully we can get this done in one take so so let's talk about this 20 moa rail um there are two reasons why you would select a 20 moa rail or 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 10 moa or 30 or 40. i've actually got a gun that's got a 40 moa rail on it um and, and the first reason is that you need to get to a longer range and your scope will not get you there uh, out of the box. So for instance, our um, Athlon Optic that we selected, it has uh, a, a total distance of 20 MOA, uh, I'm sorry, 20 mil, uh, and that's total um, elevation adjustment. That means from a center point in the scope, I've got 10 mil up, 
and I've got 10 mil down. Um, in the case of a thousand yard shot on a 300 Win Mag, this isn't going to be the biggest deal in the world because uh, I need about 8 mil up to uh, get to 1,000 yards. In almost all cases, you know, it's rare that you would need to dial a scope down, especially if you've you've uh, scoped it at a, a or, or done your zero at 100 yards. You're you're not necessarily going to go down. So really, this 10 mil that's down uh, from center isn't even really used. So you're using more of this 10 mil up to dial out to longer distance. Well, let's say you take a cartridge that doesn't have as much, um, uh, that doesn't fly as flat as maybe a 300 Win Mag does, maybe a, a 243 or a 223, and you really wanted to stretch the distance, you might actually need to get to 1,000 yards, you might need like 13 mil up. Well, you can see quickly, you're not going to be able to dial 13 mil up because the scope has a limitation of 20 mil. And from the from, from exactly level within the scope and the barrel, you're only going to have 10 mil adjustment up. So in that case, we would add a 20 MOA rail. As it turns out, a 20 MOA rail turns out to be about um, 6 mils. I think the exact number is 5.93 mil of adjustment. So what was a 10 mil scope? Uh, to go up, you can add another 5.93, and now you've got, let's just say, essentially 16 mil of up travel. And uh, that will allow you to make that 13 mil adjusted um, um, elevation to get you downrange. So that's one of the reasons why you might select uh, 20 MOA or 40 MOA rail, is because you need more adjustment for a long range shot than what your scope's capable of, of doing for you. In our case, that's really not going to be an issue. I only need to go to a thousand yards. You know, if, if we decided we wanted to do a video series at a mile, then the 20 MOA rail is going to be there. But I, I believe there's actually a more important reason why a guy might choose a, a 20 MOA rail. And that's, that's actually what I want to talk about. So before I got into long range uh, rifles and, and getting serious about my precision rifle, uh, I was really into astronomy. That was a really big thing. Uh, I'm going to roll a few pictures here that I took. Astrophotography was was a big deal, and I really enjoyed doing that. And we took pictures of, you know, uh, you're going to see here some of these galaxies and nebula and some different deals. I should be rolling those in B-roll. And um, through that, I learned a lot about optics in general. And uh, the thing is with most optics and most optic designs and I'm just going to show you here this is the basically it doesn't matter if it's a telescope or a rifle scope or whatever you have a lens and you're looking through this lens and you see it as a circle it could even be a camera and what we know about optics is that the closer to the center you are of the lens itself the better the optical clarity is as you start moving out to the edges, you start seeing distortions in the image. And uh, two in particular that really affect both astronomy, well any scope in general, uh, is going to be chromatic aberration and coma. And I want to talk about those two today. So chromatic aberration is a failure for the lens to be able to focus all the colors at the same point. If you remember in high school, you guys probably did uh, uh, in science, you uh, took a prism and then shined a light through it and the prism broke out all the colors uh, in that spectrum. And, and you would see that as all different colors. So what that prism is doing is it's breaking up all those colors and it's, and it's showing that to you on a plane that's not focused. It's not focusing all those colors to a single point. So the further that we get out from the most clear portion of any scope, which is the center, the more of that chromatic aberration you're going to have. And as that light kind of comes through here, it'll split up the red, blue, green, and they, they're not all going to focus uh, exactly perfect. And I'm showing you right now a photo of chromatic aberration that you might see uh, in a telescope or, or um, some binoculars or any, any type of scope that's got power. And the more power that you put into the scope, the more that these distortions are going to show up. And the problem with chromatic aberration is that that image is shifted just a little bit. 
And so when you're looking at it downrange, where are you going to aim? Are you going to aim at the, the, the blue piece that's off a little bit? Or are you going to aim at the red image that's off a little bit? Or the green image that's off a little bit? Which one do you aim at? And that is the challenge as you start looking at out to the edge of the scope. The other thing that you'll see is coma. And uh, I'm putting up a picture here. This is one that I photographed. And, and you can see at the outer edges of the um, image, we, we have coma. So all stars are a point light source to us. They're so far away that they're essentially a point light source. But due to imperfections in the lens, lens design, you'll see that these stars have little tails on them. Um, and they kind of have a circular rotation around the image. And this is something, you know, you just can't get around. It's due to the uh, lens and the curvature of the lens and imperfections within the lens design. And it's called coma because uh, comets, um, as they get closer to the sun and start burning off um, gases and rocks and ice and that stuff, that's the coma, the tail of the, of the uh, comet that you're seeing. So we call that coma. Um, and that is also another distortion that you have. So in astronomy, it's not such a huge deal because we'll just center the object in the best part of the glass and, and you won't have any of these distortions or you'll have very limited distortions and it'll look good. I can always crop the image so I'm only looking at the best part of the lens and, and I, maybe I don't care about this stuff on the outside. But in precision rifle and long range rifle and scopes in general, we've got an issue. And the issue is this. I'm going to draw another picture here. And this is our scope as we're looking into the scope. And uh, just like all um, reticles, we should have some crosshairs here. In my case, I've got some uh, dots here. These are mill dots. I think there's five. And they'll be the same moving off in the uh, windage directions. And uh, so in a scope, um, we have to compensate for bullet drop. And because of the bullet drop, although you think you're looking at the center of the glass, you're not looking at the center glass. So for instance, on a 1,000 yard shot in our um, 300 Win Mag, we're going to need 8 mils of elevation. Just so happens I've got 5 mils of elevation here in my reticle. That means I'm looking an additional 6, 7, 8. I'm looking at this part of the glass down here. And uh, there's nothing we can do about that. You're going to be looking, you know, at, at it, through a portion of the glass that's not as clear optically as the center. And so you can test this for yourself. If you look at a target at a thousand yards um, and have your scope set to uh, your 100 yard distance and then just dial it up uh, eight, ten mils or all the way to its max and look at that same target, you're going to actually see that target's going to look a little bit different. It's going to look a little bit distorted. So this is where the 20 MOA rail comes in. If you'll remember, uh, I said earlier that a 20 MOA rail is going to equal to approximately 5.93 mils. That means when I have the 20 MOA rail on the gun, I can add 5.3 mils back in, and that means that my 8 mil of adjustment, and we're just going to call this 6 mil just, just, just for the purposes of, of this discussion to make it easy. That means I can move this up 6 mils. Now I'm looking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I'm looking here. In, in the glass, this is where I'm looking. I'm looking at this location. Remember, optically, the glass is going to be clearest here. So instead of looking way far out at the edge of the glass where we have this chromatic aberration and coma, now I've moved that to an area that has better optical clarity. Now, um, you know, on a hunting rifle, do you want to have your best optical clarity at a hundred yards or do you want to have it at a thousand yards? And I say that you definitely want, want it at the longer ranges. So at the same time that we've shifted the hundred, uh, the 1,000 yard uh, up six mil from here up into this good area. We've also shifted our zero or 100 yard target up six mil. So now that 100 yard target is going to be up in this area somewhere outside of the most 
uh, best optical clarity and into an area that might have some more aberrations, which is fine. These are close range shots. Most guns are going to be capable of, of, you know, an inch and a half to two inch groups. Hopefully you guys are shooting for under an inch groups, but even with that, you know, you, you, there's no question about whether or not you're going to be able to hit a deer at 100 yards, even with this optical distortions within the scope. So for me, this is why it's so important to get a 20 MOA rail, because what I want to do is I want to shift where I'm looking at the glass from an area that is not uh, optically clear to an area that is optically clear within the lens. And uh, so now that thousand yard shot, I'm only looking two mils down from center within the, uh, within the scope. So guys, I hope you found that useful. Uh, this is why we select the uh, 20 MOA rail. And uh, I, I would uh, encourage you guys to really think about that and look at the pictures that I've provided here and uh, have a better understanding both about optics and, and why that 20 MOA rail is important. So guys, we've put the first five rounds down the barrel now. And for me, uh, the barrel break-in process is those first five rounds. And what I've put up for you on the screen is uh, a comparison between what the cleaning looked like after round one versus what the cleaning looks like today after round five uh, through this break-in process. I'll explain a lot more about the break-in process uh, in a future episode, the process that I use, how I do the cleanings and all that good stuff. But what I wanted you guys to see is just the comparison between the two. You can see after the first round firing, there's a very heavy matte appearance to it. Um, there's also still a lot of striations that you can see in the steel. If you look on the right there for after round five and things have cleaned up a little bit, uh, there's more of a mirror finish. Um, and the uh, steel looks a lot brighter. Uh, a lot of those striations are gone. We're still going to see some, um, but it, it looks pretty clean at this point. So for me, uh, at this point, we're pretty well done with the break-in process. From here, I'll start adding copper fouling to the barrel over the next five rounds. Um, and then after those next five rounds are done and I've got 10 down the barrel, I consider the break-in process done. From that point on, we'll just start shooting groups. After round 10, we'll start shooting groups of five. Um, I expect the barrel to get a little faster as the uh, copper fouling increases within the barrel. Uh, we'll get to a point of copper equilibrium, and then I'll feel pretty good about it. So I'll let you guys go ahead and take a look at this, and uh, tell me what you think. If you like this kind of view, let me know in the comments. I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. Uh, if you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe. Um, if you have any comments, leave those below. I'm always glad to answer any questions. Until next week, happy shooting.